let's grab our Bibles. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning. We made it through the first chapter. Now we're in chapter 2 of this great short epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. When you find 1 Thessalonians 2, let's go ahead and stand up together as we acknowledge, even with our physical posture, that what we're hearing is not the word of man, but the very inspired, infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of the only true and living God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to look through verses 1 to 4 this morning. 2, 1 to 4. Listen now to the word of the great and living God. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, you know we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I've spent a bit of time in my life, quite a bit actually, trying to study the great men and women of the faith and church history whom God was pleased to use for marvelous ends, for his own holy purposes. I've, I've thought much, quite a bit about church history and why it is that God would seem to use certain persons more than, more than other persons. And as I've looked through church history, often found myself quite motivated by the lives of the saints who've gone before us. And one of the things I've been asking myself recently is, why is it that God uses, in incredible ways, certain of men and certain of women? What is it about those particular people that God has used for such dynamic moments in church history? Now, obviously here, we're a Reformed church, and so we know the answer to that. We know that the reason why God uses men and women in particular is because he can, because he's glorious, because he's sovereign over all things, and he chooses whoever he wants, and he raises them up, and he uses them for his own divine, divine purposes. So I'm not challenging that this morning at all. In any way, I don't want you to hear me say that. But still, I've been wondering about the certain even personalities of the kinds of people that God has been pleased to use. And what is it about them, men like Luther, uh, who had such zeal, or... Uh, Elizabeth Elliot, I'm always amazed by her story, how she went back to the Wyodani Indians even after her husband had been killed, Jim Elliot. I've thought about people like William Tyndale, the first translator of the English Bible, how, how he pressed on despite innumerable obstacles. And I've thought about William Wilberforce, who was so instrumental in the, the banishment of both the slave trade and slavery itself. And I've been trying to identify what is it about these men and women that God that God has been so pleased to use them for such dramatic things. Now, first thing, that, the first thing that comes to my mind is that each one of them had what we might think of as an X factor that made them unique. At Whitfield, a couple weeks ago in Sunday school, I talked about his amazing voice, how he had this powerful, like literally the physical mechanism of his voice was able to project and to preach so dynamically that he could preach to 10,000 people in a day before microphones and amplification. That's an X factor uh, gift, an attribute that probably none of us here have. Or Jonathan Edwards is intellect. He's just so smart. And I think about these men and women and their talents, and they're just so rich and, and wonderful in so many ways. And yet, uh, there, there has to be something, if we're gonna make a Venn diagram, there's gotta be some overlapping attribute that's a commonality between them that God was pleased to use them in these ways. Again, remember, sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, not challenging that, but what is it about them? And so it's not that they were smarter than us. There's a lot of smart people in the room. Some of them, though, had great intelligence, no doubt. It's not that they lived any longer than us and they were able to accomplish more. In fact, some of them lived quite short lives. They were cut down on their primes. It's not that they're physically stronger than any of us here, although certainly I'm impressed with their ability to endure pain and suffering and even trial physically in the body, and that's impressive. But what is it then about them that seems to be that undeniable attribute that enables them to press on and do great things? And as I thought about this question, and especially as I came to our text this morning, I think... 
I might have identified that common trait. And if you still have your Bible open, and I hope you do, um, here it is in verse 2 of our chapter this morning. Look at it. See if you see, if you see it too. But though we had already suffered and been sh uh, shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had, here it is, boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. And every time I look through church history and I'm thinking about the kinds of men and women that God used for great and marvelous things in their time and in their generation, it does seem to be that they had this, boldness in our God. Now, when I say boldness this morning, I want to I want to talk about a certain kind of boldness. The kind of uh, uh, righteous audacity that I'm going to label a holy boldness this morning, because obviously when we think of the concept of boldness, we might get off on the wrong track and I don't want to do that. There's a certain kind of boldness that is here described in 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. And so let's just say what it's not. First of all, this kind of boldness is not an arrogance. Though undoubtedly many arrogant people, like to be honest, arrogant people do accomplish great things. But what's the difference? When it's an arrogant person accomplishing great things, they're doing it for their own glory, for their own name, for their own ends and purposes. And here, Paul specifically says that we had a boldness in our God. So it's not this kind of arrogance that's rooted in myself or self-confidence or self-glory. It's not that. Though those people, they, that they're arrogant, they may have a boldness, they build great corporations, they win elections, they build armies, they can do all kinds of things, but notice it's for the self. This is a holy boldness though, and not only is it not an arrogant boldness, but it's also not a foolish boldness as well. We've all seen people who are incredibly brave, and the reason that they're so brave is because they're so stupid, right? They're foolish. And they risk things that they ought not to risk. Sometimes these people have no inhibition. They have no shame. They act very boldly because they're so entirely uh, unaware of how they come off to everybody else. Can you think of somebody that may be like that? Uh, they're, they're bold because they're, they're shameless. And they should be shameful because they're embarrassing themselves. But it's not that kind of a boldness. And, and neither is it a reckless sort of a physical recklessness. I'm not talking about that either. Now, I think I told you once before that uh, when God called me to be a pastor, I was a sophomore in high school. The only job I ever wanted to have before that, going back to middle school, was I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. And so I've always had this, this real esteem and admiration for people who are willing to throw their physical body off of high objects at great rates of speed. That's always been impressive to me. You know, so you, you see like paragliders and hang gliders and people jumping out of airplanes and people doing parkour, running across the tops of buildings. I, like that always impresses me, but I'm not talking about a physical recklessness of, of putting life and limb in unnecessary, unnecessary jeopardy. So, so what is this holy boldness that God is so pleased to use for great things? Well, let's press into the text here a little bit. Uh, let's press into the text in verse 2, and I'm going to use a little bit of Greek here, not, not to intimidate you. You don't need to even remember this, other than the point that I'm trying to make here. Uh, looking into this word for boldness here in verse 2, uh, it's eparesiamatha. Now, I can hardly pronounce that, and you certainly don't need to remember it either. Eparesiamatha is the word. I know just enough about Greek to get myself into trouble here. One of the things I know is that if you add the prefix epi to any word in Greek, it always intensifies it, makes it stronger. So you take any concept, add epi to it, and you got a, a stronger version of that thing. Well, this is eparesiamatha. So this is a, a boldness that's intensified. So parasia means boldness. So if we have eparesia, then we have an intense Boldness is what we're talking about here. So it's only used, this word, nine times in the New Testament. That's it. That's not a lot. But when you begin to look through the data of this word, these nine times that it's used, you really begin to see some commonalities here coming out of this word. So for instance, the first thing that jumps off the page as I look up this word is that it's almost always used in terms of a boldness of speech. It's always somebody is speaking boldly. And in fact, it's variously translated as speak boldly, declare boldly, preach boldly. And here's another interesting factor about this word, eparesiamatha, 
is not only is it related to speech, but we always, or not always, very many times of the nine, we see a qualifying phrase that follows it, such as, in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Lord, or for the Lord. Or in our case here in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, notice how it's, how it's clausd here. We had boldness in our God. So this is kind of holy boldness that's rooted in our confidence, not in ourselves, but in Him. In Him. And so I'm going to go ahead and define the word first, and then we're going to look back at our text, and we're going to draw out from it three implications from having this kind of holy boldness. Here's my definition, all right? I didn't get this out of a dictionary or an encyclopedia. This is just Everhard's definition here. But holy boldness is, and I'm going to say this twice, the unshakable conviction that God's promises are true with the courage to act and to speak accordingly. That's my definition. I'll say it again. Holy boldness is the unshakable conviction that God's promises are true with the courage to act and to speak accordingly. So if you want some alliterative pairs, we might call it Christian courage or fearless courage faithfulness or intrepid inspiration or biblical boldness or Christ-like confidence. Pick any term you want. I'm just going to call it holy boldness today. And so let's go back through the text here and let's pull out some of its applications and implications as we see it in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4. So let's say this is our first observation about this holy boldness. Point number one, main point number one in the outline this morning Look at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. You know, brothers, who are the brothers here, the Thessalonians, that our coming to you, who was our, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, when they came to the Thessalonians in Acts chapter 17, it was not in vain. And so you Thessalonians, you've had a, a real-life illustration of what this boldness is like. And Paul says... It was us. Paul says, it was in us as we preached the gospel to you. And I can't disagree with that. In fact, if there's anybody in all of history, biblical history or, or after the Bible history, who certainly manifested this attribute of holy boldness, you, you have to admit that Paul is on the top of the list. Right? But what is it about Paul? Well, specifically in verse 1, is that he does not want to live in a way that is in vain. Now, you know that word, vain, because it's the same word from whence we get our word vanity when we talk about people who are vain. They have vanity. And vanity uh, happens to line up quite nicely with the word vanish in English. And that's exactly what it means. If you have vanity, you are living for those things that pass away. That's what vanity is. If you're physically vain... You're living for your own temporal beauty, which is undoubtedly going to be wiped away by wrinkles and gray hair in due time, right? That's what vanity is. It's living for things that are temporary. Now, Paul says here, we, when we came to you, it was not in vain. In other words, it was eternally significant. So if somebody were to ask me, like, how do I know if I'm living in vain? Well, the way, the way I draw the line is it, is it eternity. Because if the thing that you're living for is undoubtedly going to pass away, if it's rooted in time, if it's temporary, if it's fading, if it's like mist, then it's vain. But contrary-wise, if it, if, it, if it is eternal, if it has e enduring significance, then it matters, and it matters significantly, and it matters ultimately. So as Christian people, when we think about what matters in life, like, look, we want to live for things that count. We want to live for the sake of eternity. We want to live for things that are going to, that are going to pass through that temporal divide where time gives way to forever. Okay? So I want to frame up my life always focusing on those things that matter the most. So I'm talking about worship. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about Christ. I'm talking about prayer and his studying his word and I want to live my life in a way that, that is really for concern of, of people and I'm thinking about heaven and I'm thinking about hell and I want people to, to get saved and to come to Christ and I want to raise my children in a way so that they know the Lord too. All of these things matter and they matter significantly and eternally important. And so many other things that we're wasting our time with 
They're vain, they're going to vanish, and they're passing away. So Netflix and football, even the Browns, yes. Instagram likes, my goodness, can you think of anything more vain than Instagram likes? And some of us, were just building our whole lives around this. We ought to ask ourselves every morning when we wake up, we ought to ask ourselves, self, is there anything that I'm going to do today that is of eternal significance? If so, press into that. That's what matters. And so I'll just lay this down as a general rule. If you're doing anything for Christ, anything, no matter how small, it is eternally significant and therefore not in vain. That's what you want. And Paul is very clear throughout his letters that if you serve Christ, it will not be in vain. None of it. None of it will be lost. Listen to a few verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not, what? In vain. Not in vain. Mm -mm. Philippians 2, 16. Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Here's one more for you. This is Matthew 10, 42. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cold cup of water because he is my disciple. Truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. What I take from that is that even small acts, even small acts that are done for the name, for the glory, for the sake of Christ, are never in vain. And so you, listen, you may be the, the, the backup sound guy every third Sunday. You may be the, the fourth usher in rotation every third Lord's Day. You, you may be the one who is the backup to the backup to the backup in the nursery. Or you may preach to six people or 600 people. It does not matter. If you're preaching for the sake of Christ, then you lift up this book and you extol the words therein and you trust that God is going to use it. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing something for the glory of Christ, even if, even, like, look, even if you're, you're stuck at home, you're homebound, and you, all you can do is pray, then pray as though the living and true God hears your prayers and is ready and willing to answer them. That's how you pray. And when Christ gives you something, no matter how small it is to do for the sake of his name, then you can be empowered in all boldness to pursue it with vigor. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. We're just going to do a real quick side road here in Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 1. One of my favorite of the Proverbs. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Love it. Love it. What does that mean? The wicked flee when no one pursues. They're always afraid. Take no risks. Make no gambles. Always angling towards surety. Always angling away from any risk. Why? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of what? Losing it all. And if you're living for this life, if you're living for this temporary life, then you are, in fact, going to lose it all. And so what do the wicked do? They flee. They flee all the time. They're always anxious. They're always worried. They're always afraid. They're always afraid that their tiny little kingdom that they're building up right now and here and now is going to be taken away from them. And one day it actually will be taken away from them. They run even when nobody is pursuing them. However, look at the second part. The righteous are as bold as a lion. They're not afraid have no reason to be afraid because their cause is right and their God is true and their motive is pure. Therefore, they pursue like a lion, right? Think of all the animals of the jungle. You have hyenas always you know, scurrying around trying to steal meals from others. But the lion, he is the king. He is top of the food chain bold. He's not arrogant. He's just confident in who he is and who his identity is. Is. And so when a lion pursues, he pursues, not all the time, doesn't pursue everything, but when he pursues, he pursues with pace and fury. And Paul had that. And so did Luther and Tyndale and others like them. So the first thing is that our boldness is empowered by doing what is eternally 
significant. Now, let's go on to the second point here, which is in verse 2. Okay, second observation about this boldness is that boldness enables us to press forward despite innumerable obstacles. All right, now look at verse 2. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, you know we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So here Paul begins to remind them of what happened to them in Philippi. Okay. Now, when you, when you go back to Acts chapter 17, and we're going to go to Acts 16 here in just a moment, just recall that Paul suffered in Thessalonica even as he suffers on the heels of coming from Philippi just prior. You got three cities in Macedonia. You have the Philippians, uh, you have Philippi, you have Thessalonica, and you got Berea. And in both of the first two, Paul suffers and he's mistreated and he's, he's harmed, he's physically harmed, he's, he's attacked, right? And so what happens to most of us, almost like this is why many of us aren't going to be great. Because the moment we hit resistance, we quit. We come up to a resistance point and we bail out. Luther was excommunicated from the church. Many people would have stopped right there. Elizabeth Elliot's husband was arrowed down in the river, bleeding out, and she went back to the Wyodani Indians and led them to Christ as a widow with small children. Came up to a resistant point and went past it. Tyndale, I love the story, Tyndale, first translator of the English, his manuscript for the Old Testament, which he had worked on for years, he was in a, an incident on sea, and it was lost in the ocean. The whole thing. And he hadn't saved it on his hard drive. Big mistake right there. Of course, it was the 1500s, so how could you blame him? He had to start over. He had to start over. All of his Hebrew, all of his manuscripts for the entire Old Testament, lost in the sea. And guess what? He just started over. And so there's something about this holy boldness that certain people have. I wish there were more of us in the room that had it, including myself, that when they come to this resistance point where hostility and conflict and difficulty and frustration come, these people with this eparasiamatha, they pursue and they keep going. Whereas the most of us quit. Now, let's go to what Paul is talking about here uh, when he mentions his resistance in Philippi. And just look at by way of survey, what he's talking about in verse 2. Okay, so in your Bible, go with me back to Acts chapter 16. And let's look at what happened to him in Philippi. We're not going to do this in great depth here, but I do want to survey this because Paul just said in verse 2, he said, But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God. So he's assuming that we know what happened in Philippi. So let's just make sure we do know what happened in Philippi. Acts chapter 16, Paul gets this call, this divine call. He's already a missionary. That happened in Acts chapter 13. But here in chapter 16, Paul is at one point going to go a certain direction, but the Lord changes his trajectory. And instead, God changes his trajectory and pushes him over towards Macedonia. Paul, in Acts chapter 16, he has this vision of God, There's, or this person who's beckoning him. Verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul at night of a man of Macedonia standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and to help us. And look at this, verse 10. When Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, what did I say was the definition of this holy boldness? It is a surety and a confidence in the promises of God. That's where it begins. So Paul has no doubt that what he is about to do is the will of the Lord. And now he's going to go. And what happens when he gets to Philippi? Well, the first thing that happens in verses 11 to 15 is he has a beautiful and glorious conversion. Lydia gets saved. Oh man, this is going to be good. God calls. God promises, God makes good on his promises. This is going to be easy. Until, verse 16, of chapter 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And so Satan attempts to thwart the mission here. Satanic resistance. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm preaching a sermon or a Bible study and some demon-possessed Wiccan girl starts screaming at me the entire time I'm trying to preach, it might be a little frustrating, right? It might be one of those resistance points where we just kind of hit satanic resistance and we say, well, I guess our work here is done. But not those with holy boldness, they press on. And so Paul, he's an apostle. He has the ability to cast out demons. He does so. And what happens next? Well, in verse 22, the crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments of them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. So here, not only does he have demonic or spiritual resistance, but he also has popular or secular resistance. Do you think the crowd is always going to cheer us on, Gospel Fellowship? You think it might be possible that as we preach, even as we're trying to be faithful in what we say, that this might happen to us too, that the crowd may actually turn on us? Possible. In fact, even likely. And then it gets worse. Verse 24. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet and the stocks. So then, a first satanic resistance, and then popular resistance, and then legal or civil resistance. All of these things are building up on the Apostle Paul, and none of them were able to make him quit. Eparesiamatha. Holy boldness. He goes on. So the reason why a lot of us in this room were not going to be great is because many of us are quitters. And we quit at far less than what Paul ever experienced. Some of us quit just because we get bored or distracted. Or maybe we get a critical comment. Or simply, nobody pats us on the back like we thought they were going to do. We wanted our name in the bulletin, and nobody put it in the bulletin. So we quit. But holy boldness does not. It presses on. It seems to be this attribute that God uses most to his glory in which his people, men and women, press on into further obedience, pursuing his glory. And then third, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, our main text today. I want to show you this as well about this kind of holy boldness is that it is focused on pleasing the one over the many. Listen for it very clearly here in the text. Look at verses 3 and 4 in your Bible. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Verse 4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, key phrase here, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So if you were to say, Paul, Paul, how do you keep on going when there's so much resistance against you? And Paul would say, because my heart has been tested and I know my motives are pure and I know I'm preaching the right gospel because this is the gospel to which I have been assigned. Now, a couple of things here, first of all, about the testing of motives, right? Because not all motives are pure. Some people do good things for wrong reasons, right? Absolutely. Some people do evil things for evil reasons, but some people, they're deceived though, and they do good things, but they have false motives. And sometimes, here's the tricky part about our hearts, is we're not even aware of how deceived we actually are. Paul says he's not deceived. Right? Look at that. He says, our appeal does not spring for error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. You say, Paul, how can you possibly know that you're not deceiving yourself when it comes to your own motives? Here's how Paul knows. Because he constantly does the heart work. And this is soul work here. I can't do this for you. You can't do this for me. But this is the soul work of constantly analyzing our motives and our methods based on Scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to do that work of uh, testing and reproving and correcting us. Right? So Paul says, I can tell you that my motives are pure because the gospel is pure and I keep checking myself over and over and over again against the scriptures and against the Holy Spirit. And so he does this soul work of checking to make sure he is not deceiving, that his motives are right, even as he goes. And the more he's sure that his motives are pure, the more boldness he has to continue on. And then look at this. This may be, for some of you, a very freeing thought this morning. Very freeing thought here in verse 4. For we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests the hearts. That is the key to boldness. 
And take it from a person. I'm going to speak personally here. Don't use this against me. Take it from a person who has spent much of my life trying to make people happy. Okay? I was born with a natural heart defect such that I care too much what other people think. As a child, I wanted to please my parents, my teachers, and my coaches. I never wanted to let anybody be disappointed. And when I grew up, the temptation to keep everybody pleased in the church, keep my elders pleased, keep my fellow presbyters pleased, keep my editor pleased, keep my publisher pleased, whoever else, I'm constantly wanting everybody to just be glad in what I'm doing. And I will tell you this, trust me, if you, if you want to be entirely exasperated and frustrated, if you want to chase the wind in vanity, if you want to grab oil in the hand and watch it slip through your fingers, live to please other people. So it'll never work. Why, why, why not? Because they all have different motivations for what you ought to be doing. And everybody has a different set of priorities for what you ought to be doing with your time. And if you do that, if you live for other people, I'm telling you right now, you will grind your fingers to the bone in exhaustion and you will never have the boldness to press on when resistance comes in your life. But if you please the one true and living God as your ultimate and highest motivation, then you will have the endurance to press on no matter what anybody says or what anybody thinks. So let's wrap up here with a couple of applications here this morning. Two applications very quickly. Number one, if as I'm preaching this morning on this holy boldness, this, this righteous audacity, and you've recognized in your own heart that you don't have this, then ask him for it. Ask him for it. If, if you're naturally constituted in such a way that you, 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 you tend to be intimidated, you, you tend to back down. You, you tend to be constantly analyzing what are the negative repercussions that are going to happen if I say this or, or step out here or do this, this amazing thing there. If you're constantly of that natural inclination in which you don't tend towards boldness and courage, then simply ask the Lord for it. And perhaps he might give you this holy boldness in greater measure. And if he does give you this holy boldness, then the second application is equally necessary. Then ask him for opportunities to use it. Because I can guarantee you that there are going to be times, especially in the near future, when we are going to need to have a greater boldness to stand for the glory of Christ. You're going to need it. There are things in our culture today that we're going to need to speak out against. There are things in our culture that are, that are shifting underneath our feet that you're going to have to have the courage to stand down and not blink. Inflexible. Bold as a lion. Many of the great people that God used, Tyndale and Luther and Katie Von Bora and Whitfield, they all had this, but their generation has come and gone, and it is our time to be faithful now. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion.